If you want to win in fantasy baseball, you got to get some steals. No, I'm not talking about stolen bases. I mean, on draft day, you want some steals in the draft. Some guys are going way later than they should. And I'm not talking about sleepers, breakout candidates, rookies, and those guys. I'm talking about known veterans, guys who have proven they can perform and are just being drafted later than they should. If you can't wait for draft season, guess what? You don't have to. Join Underdog Fantasy and you can draft right now for MLB Best Ball for the 2024 season. They've got some new contests that just opened up. Check them out right now. If you sign up and use promo code ENDGAME, you get a 100% deposit match for your first $100 that you put into your account. Try Underdog Fantasy today. Let's start out with a pitcher who is a dark horse candidate for the AL Cy Young. Yeah, Zach Eflin in Tampa Bay had an amazing season last year and still being undervalued. Now, I get it. There's some trepidation here because he's had some injuries his career and, you know, he hasn't really proven that he can be consistent. But let's look at what he did last year. Across 177 innings pitched, he won 16 games and he struck out 186 batters. But more impressive is what he didn't do as walk batters. 3.4% walk rate, only George Kirby better. And while to some extent you can say, well, yeah, being in Tampa, that helps. They obviously know what they're doing with pitchers. Take any veteran pitcher basically and can mold him into a Cy Young candidate, it seems. Well, Eflin has been on this path for a while. If you look, his whip has been lower every year since 2019. The low walk rate obviously helps, but he's gotten better and better at figuring out how to get batters out. Elite walk rate, pretty good strikeout rate. The wins will be there on a good team. Injury risk, just don't even bring that up because there is no starting pitcher in the game that doesn't have injury risk. He hasn't had Tommy John or anything major. Hopefully he doesn't go the path of some other Tampa Bay stars. Well, look, Eflin is a guy who legit could be a number one starting pitcher for fantasy teams, and you're getting him right now close to pick 90. I'll take that discount. You want a little more risk with your risky veteran arm? How about a guy who's already seeing his ADP fall because of one spring outing? Joe Musgrove of the Padres. I get the concerns because last year, filled with injuries, the first thing was kind of a freak thing, his toe, because he dropped a kettlebell on it. All right, took him a little while to get going after that, but then the end of the year shut down because of right shoulder inflammation. That's a concern. And in his first spring training outing, he got lit up at least to the extent that you can get lit up after facing four batters. Didn't get any of them out. Walk, walk, hit, ground rule double, and he was yanked. But let's remember this was his first actual game action since last August. Are we really going to freak out because he faced four batters in a spring game where he's just knocking the rust off? I'm not. In fact, I was kind of glad to see this because I know his ADP is going to fall even more. He's already outside the top 100, and now I feel like I can get him even later. Look, let's remember that the last two seasons before last year, this guy threw exactly 181 innings back-to-back years. He also notched a 1.08 whip in back-to-back years and an ERA right around three. Look, this is what you want. Mid-rotation guy who is dependable. He can help you with ratios. He can get strikeouts. The injury is always going to be a concern with any starting pitcher. And yeah, he might get off to a slow start, but at the bargain you're getting him for right now, I'm willing to take a chance. All right, on to a veteran hitter. Only two years at the major league level, but that's because Seiya Suzuki came from overseas. Put up good, but not great numbers, at least for fantasy last year. Hit 285, 20 home runs, 6 steals. Decent in terms of runs and RBIs. So this guy doesn't overall fit the mold of a league winner. But there's room for improvement. He also missed some time last year, 24 games missed, and he really started to pick up toward the second half of the season. I don't think we've seen yet the best that Suzuki has to offer. But again, we're looking for a steal. My main thing here is he's being undervalued, especially when I look at a guy who I feel is very comparable, like Brian Reynolds. Sure, Reynolds had four more home runs and a handful more steals, but 24 and 12, that's not league winning material either. Like Reynolds is solid, but very similar to Suzuki. And if we see Suzuki healthy with this Cubs offense, still returning a lot of the same players in place, I think these guys are pretty much the same. And yet look at that big difference. A couple of rounds later, you can get Suzuki. Suzuki versus Reynolds. I'm going to wait and I'll take Suzuki instead because to me, 
you know, the difference is negligible. Now we get around pick 120, look for another dependable, maybe boring starting pitcher, but Sonny Gray just feels like he's not getting enough respect. Look, Gray's never been a guy who's going to blow hitters away. He's not going to do anything that's going to make you jump up and take notice. He's just solid, dependable. Isn't that what you want? Last year, he actually had his best season since back in 2015 when he was with Oakland. A 279 ERA, 1.15 whip, and he started 32 games. And again, I have to underscore that 32 starts, that's so important. When you get to this stage of the draft and you're looking for arms to fill out your rotation, a guy who you know will be out there every five games and he's going to put up solid numbers. He will not hurt you. He will not get lit up and his strikeout rate is just fine. Sure, he might be an accumulator. That's what I'm looking for in a mid-rotation guy. And moving to St. Louis, not a bad thing at all. Look, as far as being with the Twins, that was just fine. Not like that was a hitter-friendly park. But St. Louis is even less hitter-friendly and, in fact, is on the lower end in terms of home run park factor. So this might even be better for Gray. And then on the other hand, we have Hunter Green. All right, I can't say that this is like a proven veteran or anything like that. But we've known about Green for a while, even before he cracked the majors. One of the more elite prospects. Arm talent is through the roof. But yet... Disappointing last year because, man, the whip was kind of ugly and a lot of people are scared because maybe think the command is just not there yet or he'll give up too many home runs. But I also think for such a young, talented pitcher, some people are just a little quick to give up on somebody who's this talented because besides the fact that, sure, he was inconsistent, he also showed flashes of brilliance and he seems to be even healthier heading into this season than he was last season. But one thing that if you've been tracking him this preseason, he's adding not one, but two new pitches. That's right, a curve and a splitter. He already debuted it in spring training, and the results were pretty good. Four Ks in two innings. This is the pitcher that was already in the 90th percentile in terms of K rate last year, and now he's adding two more potential out pitches. For someone who legitimately has the upside to be one of the best pitchers in the National League right now, I can't comprehend why he's available so late. And the same thing goes for a veteran slugger like Marcelo Zuna, who only hit 40 home runs and drove in 100 RBIs last year. And we're not talking about a guy who sank your batting average either. He hit 274, and oh yeah, he still plays in probably the best lineup in all of baseball, hitting behind guys like Matt Olson, Ozzy Albies, oh, and Ronald Acuna. And while this may mean nothing ultimately, it is interesting to note that in spring training, he got to look at first base. And of course, first base is pretty much spoken for in Atlanta. But if potentially Olsen has an IL stint or if they try to mix and match sometimes, get Ozuna some more eligibility. What if he adds first base eligibility? But look, even if Ozuna just takes a slight step back from last year, you're still talking about a guy with 30 plus home runs at the very minimum, not going to hurt your batting average, driving a bunch of runs and you can get him as like your third or fourth outfielder, why not? Back to starting pitching and back to the Padres. You know, it's funny because I feel like Michael King was getting a little too much hype last year because he is a Yankee, right? That New York East Coast bias, it just happens. And now I feel like he's suffering from the opposite effect. Now that he's with San Diego, like nobody's talking about how good he was last year. And we should be, because this is a pitcher who had the third highest CSW percentage behind only Spencer Strider and Tyler Glass now. That's called strikes and whiffs. Basically, he throws a lot of strikes and he gets guys out. And moving from New York to San Diego makes him a lot less exciting, but it makes him a lot more interesting and fancy because he's going from Yankee Stadium to Petco Park. And we know that Petco is pitcher friendly. Out of 30 major league ballparks, Pecco ranked 29th in park factor over the past three years. And in just terms of home run park factor, Yankee Stadium up there, third highest, Petco 21st. We can't even talk about this negatively in terms of wins because he only won four games last year. Remember, King was a bullpen arm most of the year and then got converted to starter late. So I guess the only knock on him is that we don't know exactly how many total innings he will accumulate this season because he hasn't been a full-time starter at the major league level, but I imagine the Padres traded Juan Soto to get him to make him a full-time starter over a full season. I also remember the fact that at one point, the Yankees, whether they meant it or not, 
we're saying things like, yeah, we'd like to get Soto, but we just really don't want to give up Michael King to do it. I'm pretty sure that was more negotiating tactic than anything, but hey, the Padres wanted King. He was great last year. I think he can be great in the rotation over a full year, and he's available around pick 150. And then I feel like I have to talk about a Yankee that has basically been left for dead. Giancarlo Stanton is not even being drafted in a lot of fantasy leagues. Look, I totally get if you're just tired of hearing about him, of seeing him sink your batting average. I get it, right? I mean, he wasn't just injured a lot last year like he has been for a lot of his career. He was just bad. Couldn't even hit the 200 mark for batting average. But I don't think that Stanton is just dust. I mean, this guy has plenty of juice left if when he's healthy. And even if we don't get close to a full season of him, when he's hot, he's one of the best sluggers in the game. And I think it's worth taking note of the fact that he has noticeably slimmed down this offseason. Hitting the weights, I guess, or not hitting the buffet. It's worked. He's definitely a trimmer. And he's adjusted his batting stance, which is also more interesting. A little more upright. We'll see if that makes a difference or not. You know, it's too soon to tell whether these things will actually translate to better production. But I know the focus is going to be there. He's called out a little bit by his GM. Maybe the motivation is there just to prove people wrong. Whatever the case is, at the very least, you're talking about a last round pick. Why would you not take a chance on a guy like Stanton? I think those are some of the best and smartest picks you can make in fantasy drafts based on ADP. But what about the worst picks you can make? Some of the biggest reaches based on ADP. Well, I got that right here. 